And it's supporting and exporting capitalism, and you know about privatizing profits. Um, you just have to talk about the uh, nuclear power industry to understand that. It's socializing losses. It undermines academic freedom, uh, science and technology in service of the warfare state. Uh, there's billions of dollars each year uh, that go to support military research in most universities. And Oak Ridge Institute for Nuclear Studies partners with, partners with Southeast University uh, right after the Manhattan Project and the uh, evaporation of like, Hirosh you know, Hirosh Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, and now we've got over 100 southern institutions that are uh, deeply in the pocket of the Pentagon. And in fact, scientific research. Who's familiar with uh, Project Paperclip? Ever heard of Project Paperclip? Good. Uh, right after war, it was like the rush between us and the Russians to like kidnap, uh, you know, just to hire, to coerce, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, dedicated Nazi scientists, engineers, people who were working in engineering to get them into our frame. And these ardent Nazis were granted U.S. citizenship. They were given prominent positions with universities, with defense contracts, and usually CIA fronts. And that Nazi philosophy became embedded within our own military industrial complex just by default. Uh, well, the military industrial complex is consuming the majority of our oil and petroleum. Uh, I mean, we just have to realize they consumed, in 2010 alone, 360,000 barrels. This is just what they report. Uh, and what we're finding in a lot of our research is that you can't really get at all of the definitive figures. Uh, you're skimming the surface. But it's horrific information. Is that really a majority or what percent is it? Pardon? Is that really a majority of the oil, or how, what percent of the oil is actually at all? Uh, the percentage, I couldn't tell you, but I do know that the fact, you know, is that uh, a relatively few people compared to the whole population, and certainly the luxury lifestyle of, you know, citizens does not, you know, I mean, does contribute greatly. But in one year, the military is using, uh, you know, 14 to 20 years worth of, like, petroleum uh, compared to the rest of the United States system, transportation system. Is that close to an answer for you? Because I can't give you the exact percentage. Yeah, I'd love to dive into those numbers at some point. Yeah, that yeah, right. And you'll find that if you begin to research defense data, it's hard to come up with. So, you know, uh, by doing that, it's driving global warming. And our, our, our uh, military understands this. They understand that global warming, warming is a threat to warfighter readiness, is how they term it. Uh, and the, the military is exploiting the peak oil crisis. We need this oil not only for domestic uses, but to fuel our military. Um, and, and President Obama, um, he's aware that the southern leg of this pipeline um, crossing more than 500 water bodies on its, on its journey down to uh, Port Arthur in Texas is, is, is really a difficult thing. MIC acts with impunity. The Geneva Conventions strictly forbid the use of weapons that have intergenerational impacts. And we've been using weaponized uranium, uh, sometimes termed depleted uranium, which is sort of a misnomer because it's just not efficient enough to work in a reactor, uh, to make uh, hard-hitting, uh, you know, penetrating uh, projectiles. Uh, that's another factory up in Jonesboro, Tennessee, that does that. But the mass and indiscriminate destruction that, that our warfighter readiness has engaged in is really a crime. It leaves us toxic legacy. Uh, this is this is uh, the intergenerational impact of our weapons systems um, in Fallujah, where we really bombarded with weaponized uranium bullets. Um, many men, and then down below, you see the children, armless children from Agent Orange. Two of my brothers were served in Vietnam, and they died from Agent Orange and its uh, toxins. So uh, uh, Hiroshima, where we've got the remnant landmines, and it pollutes physical, cultural political environments. Uh, we have wrongful, what appears to be wrongful imprisonment in Guantanamo for years with people who are uncharged. Uh, the pollution of the cultural environment in Afghanistan, Pakistan. I mean, if you offer me $10,000 to point out a Taliban, you know, there he is right there. You know, that's pretty much the way it goes. So the majority of the prisoners that we have down there, although there's some high value, like nasty people, we think, we're pretty sure we're told, the majority of them have just come in for a price. Most have been clear. And the military industrial complex um, is polluting our very heavens. Uh, look, we're tracking at a minimum of 18,000 objects that are going around in orbit. This junk 
all throughout our space. That's an impact of militarism. The MIC promotes something that is a call, has been called, and we found out, American War Christianity. Uh, you can read with me that it's the belief that the U.S. is God's chosen instrument to bear a sword against evil doors and advance the gospel wherever we decide to force blue planet. You can Google American War Christianity and there's like a rising, you know, uh, volume of information on it. It's, uh, although it's a national phenomenon, it's a particular southern, you know, uh, uh, event. Uh, where evangelical Vietnam uh, veterans came back, entered their churches, began to like, uh, you know, work this. It, the question is, is American holy war going on? Uh, the military-industrial complex is eroding our civil liberties, and I guess you attorneys would know that um, certainly. Uh, it's, it's the Center for Constitutional Rights. It's the undoing of our democracy very severely, um, perhaps never to be regained. Uh, the woman on the right was hit with a rubber bullet as an occupied protester. Increasingly, dissent is criminalized. Increasingly, um, we're, we're being treated as terrorists when we're simply nonviolent actionists. And in, in our own military, the women um, are subject to um, uh, assault by their own fellow soldiers in astronomic numbers. Um, and then force feeding hunger strikers is going on in our prison systems. It's going on in Guantanamo. And those are people that are asserting the very last use of nonviolent action when you're in prison sometimes is refusing to cooperate. Uh, while we militarize the homeland, uh, 2012 National Defense Authorization Act, again the report, uh, opinion of the Center for Constitutional Rights, uh, effectively endorses war without end and makes indefinite military detention without charge or trial a permanent feature of the American legal system. And, of course, we're hearing more and more about the deployment of deadly drones and the, the uh, opening up of airspace, uh, civilian airspace now, uh, to all sorts of drones, whether they be searching out um, to make sure we don't have forest fires or looking for lost campers or the surveillance, the this, this saturation surveillance that is going on. I, I, lo I love this one. This is about a one-inch roach, and that's a listening device that was attached to it, like, you know, let go of the house. And then, of course, we have great accidents are happening. This, this one, this $176 million surveillance drone crashing in Maryland, that's a lot of money to go up and smoke. And mm -hmm. then we have the impact on the young soldiers who sit at a console in direct war from their, their suburban console um, and send these deadly drones out for, I would say, extrajudicial killing. Well, and it's interesting, as you depersonalize, um, you know, removing the warrior from the kill, uh, these drone pilots suffering one of the highest rates of, uh, you know, PTSD in the military. Um, the U.S. Space Command, um, they're talking about um, treaty after treaty that is broken. These are just two incidents of, of the treaties that are being broken uh, with our advance into outer space. We just came through uh, October 5th, October 12th, which was an, uh, a week of international protest of nuclearization and weaponization of space. The militarism defiles the earth and the air. And we just, that's a little bit of Hiroshima. Our rivers and springs, I mean, we've, we've talked about the radioactive strontium and tritium coming out of Oak Ridge. There's far more toxins than that that are coming out of that place and polluting waterways downstream all the way into the Tennessee River. Okay. Seas in the oceans. This is a World War II map. All the little yellow dots mount to about 9,000 sunken military auxiliary merchant marine vessels that are all rusting, the chemicals, the, the, you know, the weapons that were left on them, the oil, everything. Uh, they're rusting, they're being released. We know of about 11 submarines and at least eight reactors sitting on the bottom of the ocean. And generally speaking, uh, it's too costly, it's too deep, can't go out and get them. So. Well, there's actually no plan that I've been able to unearth. The Pentagon has no plan for dealing with all of this uh, undersea pollution that is that is really threatening the next generation. It's always the children in war. And we just have to look at the casualty statistics for any war. Um, it's war is killing children. And we could give you big numbers, but a single death is what it's about every individual child. Just pause for a minute. This is Picasso's Guernica uh, represented the bombing of vast cities during the Spanish War. It's one of the agonies of war. So Ike, 
Well, uh, Dwight David Eisenhower, he, um, he, he said it right in his outgoing speech, um, warning us about the, the military-industrial complex, and he wanted to know there how far you go without destroying from within what you're defending from without. Full-spectrum dominance is the Pentagon plan to control all, all the aspects of a battle arena, land, air, maritime, space, um, and that becomes the focus of you know, some type of global control, and we ask that this really is the national defense when you consider the cost and the impact across the board like we're trying to get to. And those are their words, full-spectrum dominance. And in, in, uh, in the South, during Roosevelt's time, when he was trying to get New Deal votes, um, the pork barrel that he offered to the South was uh, seeding our South with uh, what we would call a deal of, with the devil, with all these military bases. Um, and the Pentagon also believes that there need to be national sacrifice zones where um, our weapons and our soldiers can be tested and made, made a war fighter ready. Well, we, we contend that the South of the United States has been particularly impacted and could be considered one of those national sacrifice zones. So partly what we're asking is this, you know, looking at the South as a sacrifice zone. That blue doesn't show up, that's the point. Well, I don't know. It works. We keep fiddling with it. So again, you know, it's arguably the most militarized region in the U.S. and the, the, the attendant facilities to MIC uh, would include everything that we've covered and more that we're going to cover. Is that a book? Yes, Robert Ballard, that's a, one, of, one of his books, and he and his first wife worked together on that, um, dumping in Dixie race, class, and environmental quality. Talking about the, the impacts of, of this, these environmental impacts on communities of color and communities um, on the other side of the track, whether they be poor people or people of color, usually are impacted most. Uh, our military um, has many, many, many Superfund sites. Over 130 bases are on this Superfund list. Um, but the thing that I found most horrifying is the military and the VA hospitals, they don't have any legal requirement to notify these soldiers that they might be stationed at a Superfund site. In fact, sitting on top of one. Uh, whether or not their families might be ingesting poisons and, and, uh, and these soldiers are, are ordered to these places without full disclosure. Um, there are over 8,000 FUDs, formerly used defense sites, that include former military bases, ammunition depots, ordnance, bombing targets, uh, over 1,000 in the southern states listed. And these former military bases, like this particular one, Camp Butner, they say because of the war on terror, there really isn't enough money to clean up all this unexploded ordinance. They built and built uh, suburban houses. This is just on above Durham, North Carolina. And and so families are told, well, we'll clear up within a one mile radius of your home, but beyond that, there's no funds to check for these mines. So think of a mother sending her children out to play with that. So these formerly used defense sites. Um, first of all, it's hard tracking them down. There is a list, but then sometimes when you go and find them in your own communities, you see there's just a fence around them with maybe a rusting sign on it. We're not really doing well to even clean up the mess of last wars. Your hometown. Um, in Memphis, Tennessee, where I was raised, thank you for moving me along, um, the Army Defense Depot, which was considered a place to store, you know, uh, non-lethal equipment and supplies, but during the Manhattan Project, uh, things were dropped off there that were in transit up to Oak Ridge that might have been leaky or whatever. And th all of this arsenic, cadmium, chromium, I can't read all of the litany of pesticides and mustard gas bombs. Um, this African-American neighborhood since World War II was dumped on like that. And as Doris Bradshaw, she and her family have been fighting that for some long time. She's got it right. The way you treat people of color in the U.S. is the way we're treating them throughout the globe. Then there's Mississippi. Uh, Gulfport was where we staged uh, taking, um, you know, barrels of Agent Orange before they went to Vietnam, and then they came back, and we had like, you know, these uh, 50, you know, thousands of leaking barrels, you know, stockpile before they were taken out into the Gulf uh, and uh, and incinerated, and the. Uh, you know, the impacts are, you know, still and will be for so long. 
being felt. Vietnam was contaminated by Monsanto and Dow. They destroyed everything. You've seen the pictures. You know the story. And no accountability and really no compensation. And I'll just name my na the names of uh, Daniel and Thomas Handerhan, my twin brothers, who were impacted with Agent Orange and it took them down some years after they returned from Vietnam. They yes. and so many others. Um, we still maintain an arsenal, uh, although they've been trying to reduce it. But uh, this is out in Arkansas, uh, largest collection of white phosphorus out there. Uh, and they've had lots of leaks of that white phosphorus. And again, Arkansas in the Pine Bluff area is is um, it's a really heavily populated with people of color in that region, and so they often cite these these horrific places there. Uh, in Alabama, this is a, a very interesting one in Anniston, Alabama. Um, they had all this terrible mustard gas, VX gas, stored Sarin. on site, sarin. Um, there is a, a treaty that we should be destroying these chemical weapons. So in 2003, they, they knocked on everyone's door with a gas mask and said, put it on, we're going to incinerate all of these chemicals. Um, so uh, that was not a good thing. Now we talked about the uh, Operation Paperclip. Werner von Braun, who was uh, building his rockets in a, in a death camp, I mean, he, he was using in Germany, in Germany slave labor uh, in a Nazi camp, and uh, then we enticed him to come to Huntsville, Alabama, and the Redstone Arsenal there. As you can see, it's a super fun site, so whenever you see those barrels there, it's a toxic place. And we mentioned the um, October 5th through the 12th uh, international protests, and Bruce Gagnon of the Global Network against weapons of nuclear power in space. This organization pretty much sponsored it and, you know, we're realizing more and more that the South is vital to the plan for weaponization and nuclearization of space. I think you know that from war has been fought most recently and will be fought ever after with computers and GPS and robots. So poison was rocket science. Perchloric, for example, is one of the a principal propellant for rockets and missiles. It's found in the soil and drinking water of about 43, at least 43 states, and millions drink of water contaminated by it. Um, in North Carolina, we found another formerly used defense site right down the road from uh, a War. nice liberal college. Warren Wilson, Wilson College. Um, Fifty years they were manufacturing nerve agents, explosives, and other things they're not telling us about. Um, and uh, they really, it's just kind of got a fence around it. It hasn't been really cleaned up. It's a super fun site. So Bee Tree Creek dumps into the Swan. I know it dumps into the French Broad. If you're local, you know where to fish and not fish. Where to go. And this it, is probably one of the most egregious. The Marines in North Carolina, many of you may have heard of Camp Lejeune and the poison drinking water. Well, this was a horrendous cover-up. From 57 to 87, 30 years, the military authorities knew that those water wells were poisoned and they failed to advise the families. Uh, and most of the pollution, um, in this case, a lot of the majority of the pollution came from uh, basic chemicals, underground fuel tanks that leaked off base, uh, dry cleaning fluids that were leaking in, and most of this was occurring near the family housing water wells with uh, toxic concentrations between 240 to 3,400 times safety standards. Now the Marines through that time have high, showed the highest incidence of male breast cancer and as many as a million people were exposed to these seven, at least 70 identified toxins in the contaminated water. There's been motion recently, uh, I can't quote you the suit, but they're beginning to crack it open and there's some, some level of settlement, but I, it's very late for most of the people. It won't bring back the dead, and, and it took uh, one Marine who lost his daughter from the drinking water there while he was overseas fighting the good fight. Um, his children and family were being exposed to this. But it took his diligence um, and to make this come to light. Uh, another atrocious event where soldiers and sailors and civilians are sacrificed. I mean, this is this is a pretty familiar, you know, picture where we put our soldiers out to test the you know, effect of, you know, uh, being too close to an atomic blast. At least two hundred ten thousand of them were exposed. The, this one's pretty egregious. Where I mean, I, I mean, that's a really interesting concept. Put a bunch of sailors on a tin boat out in the water and seal yourself off as a control into a room and just expose everyone on the ship to a gas. Watch what happens. It's probably steel, not tin. Yeah, well, it's just a euphemism.
And over half the U.S. nuclear weapons workers have been exposed to some high dose and of radiation. And there's been some scholarship, this, this on the right, the human radiation experiments document some of those atrocities. So reading about that will give you a sense of, I guess, what science in the service of war is capable of and how indifferent it is to people. What were people exposed to in that project? You go back one. Um, over here in Project Shad, mm -hmm. uh, nerve agents. Incapacitating agents, nerve gas, sarin. I mean, I'm just guessing now. Just the whole litany of gases. That you mean? can look it up. You can look up Project Shad because we can't d go really, really okay. deep. But a lot of this is available, even at a skimming, uh, you know, of research. I, I thought sarin was toxic, so it couldn't have been to sarin. You know, to sarin is toxic. Yeah. I mean, so they would. That's why. So I was stumbling over that. So yeah. I mean, the long list of what they use. Yeah you know, is, is, is there, but there were incapacitating and nerve agents that were like exposed inside the ship and like uh, potential, I mean there were a lot of people that died directly due to that. Then, uh, we have something called broken arrows and uh, that's a military term for nuclear weapons mishaps. I didn't know in Mars Bluff, South Carolina we had uh, dropped one. But they, they accidentally like dropped one out the back of a plane. Now uh, the nuclear capsule wasn't in the bomb, but 8,000 pounds of conventional weapons went off. And this little roadside marker where that happened. That was really exciting for that farmer that day. Uh, to Tybee Island uh, from a nuclear bomb uh, due to uh, in-flight accident, thinking that I mean the protocol is to jettison your load by by parachute, and everyone saw it come down, and it's, it's near Savannah. And as far as we can, you know, find out, it's never been recovered. They don't know where it went, quote unquote. So, and no one knows that it's ever come out. And, and then in '61, um, over Goldsboro, North Carolina, which used to used to be uh, B-52 SAC Air Command, again it was a mid-air refueling accident, and the protocol is to push the bombs out the back, parachute them down. They recovered one of them and discovered that, like uh, some say five triggers of six, somebody says six triggers of seven, but all but one trigger that would have set the bomb off, you know, was, you know, was tripped upon impact. And they know where the other bomb landed, but it's sunk down in the swamp somewhere. And they just, they just like put a fence up around it because they were afraid that the, uh, maybe the vibrations of the heavy equipment would set it off. So that's Eastern North Carolina. Yeah, and, and not far from Memphis in South Mississippi, they had something called Project Salmon in 1964. These were the salt dome area and they detonated these underground nuclear devices. And the people really, they just offered them $10 for an adult and $5 for a child for their inconvenience at being moved out while they experimented there. And they did go around for a while and tried to gather up as much of the effluent that came out of the hole where they blew it up, shoved it back down in the hole in a an assault dome and put a big monument there says basically says don't dig here. Um, back in Tennessee, Milan, you know, Milan, Tennessee, was a, uh, what was a conventional weapons, um, an arsenal um, a production. War, a World War, World War II. II. Um, it loads, assembles, packs, does all the things dis up to disposing of munitions, including now weaponized uranium ordinances. And it's also a super fun site. That's in, in sort of West Tennessee, not, not far from, say, Jackson. In Jonesboro, uh, we have Aerojet Ordnance. Uh, how many of you have heard of that? It's a weaponized uranium facility. They call it depleted uranium. That we, we need to hold that in quotes. But uh, they are uh, they're making use of part of the U.S. stockpile of 500,000 tons of this waste that weapons makers get at no cost from the Pentagon. And this stuff is definitely a war crime. Just up near where we're yeah, t Tennessee, Holston Army Ammunition Plant, that's another a Manhattan Project kind of component back in the time, 1942. Uh, steel going out is now operated by this BAE, BAE Systems. We're not entirely sure what's all going on there, but they are um, um, making ammunition, storing ammunition. When you drive by it, it's just, it looks like a nice, you know, wooded area with a long miles and miles of fence and people, it's off limits. It 
Except when they let you shoot deer. I'll say just down the road, actually, or up the road from Jonesboro, Tennessee, and the extreme northeast corner of Tennessee is Irwin. This is a nuclear fuel services, and uh, it produces the uh, fuel rods for the nuclear navy. It also has a DOE contract for uh, disposing primarily of military waste, um, but uh, it down it down blends. It separates its sources out. Uh, there is a Scandinavian company inside this compound, Studvix, which has an incinerator in operation. Uh, we use the term depleted uranium um, because it is to the military a valuable um, uh, metal because of its density. And when you make a armor-piercing projectile out of it, it will take two to three inches of steel, you know, off the tank. So uh, it's a it's it's been relicensed again for 25 years, and we have some more details about that. But the Nuclear Regulatory Commission itself, that just relicensed it, called called the, the culture there uh, involved in a callous disregard for health and safety, legal and regulatory mandates. It's in the most beautiful part of East Tennessee. I mean, you drive right by it and not realize the death emanating from that place. And then. We're in western North Carolina, and we catch downwind and downstream from Aerojet uh, in Jonesboro and NFS in Irwin. Uh, there's some active people uh, uh, locally uh, who have engaged in water, you know, like water sampling and soil samplings uh, from above Irwin and Jonesboro all the way 95 miles downstream in Nullah Chuck. We found uh, signatures of highly enriched uranium in the faucets coming out of Greenville, uh, Tennessee and the uranium contamination is from both of them. Uh, Madison County is a county that butts Tennessee. We have that, that has the highest cancer rate in the state, twice that of the national average, and it is uh, specifically because of the downwind you know, deposition uh, from these areas. And you see up in the upper right there's a sinkhole that opened up on a school playground uh, adjacent to the nuclear fuel services and when they threw dye down into that sinkhole it bubbled up in one of the holding ponds um, on the thing and Don you were talking about sinkholes and, and nuclear power plants but the southeast has plenty of them and so we here we have uranium processing facilities in areas of sinkholes it's very dangerous and of course Kings Bay uh, if you think of the state of Georgia, in the extreme southeast corner of Georgia, 30 minutes above. Okay, question? Yeah, can you go back and explain again, like the link with nuclear and sinkholes? Uh, well, there wasn't a direct link that nuclear is causing the sinkhole, but it is a, uh, you know, the, the, the strata under the ground, you know, occasionally there are sinkholes that appear. This one just happened to appear, you know, just a half a mile or so down the road uh, in an elementary school just very close, but the point was when they began, oftentimes when you have a sinkhole, you dump dye in it and you go trace it back and find out, you know, what's going on there. Well, the first place the dye from the sinkhole came up was in the sludge ponds of uh, nuclear fuel services, and then later they found it bleeding out into the middle of Chucky River. It just implies that there's an interconnecting tunnel and, you know, you know complex of cracks and fissures and underground water flowing, uh, which, and, and and we haven't even gotten into the regular discharges and the underground plumes uh, from all these facilities that are that can, that do flow out. I, so sorry if we there wasn't a direct connection to nuclear, but the sinkhole is there and it ties back to the facility underground. Okay. Okay. And then Kings Bay is about 30 minutes and, uh, above Jacksonville. Uh, let's see, and Karen and, and she left, uh, but the. Um, Trident nuclear submarine carries 24 missiles. Each missile has eight uh, warheads on it, and there's 14 subs that sit down there. It's, it's probably the, if it's seceded, it's the third largest nuclear state on the planet. And those are fueled by the product from nuclear fuel services, the enriched uranium for the fuel for these. These are first strike nuclear weapons. They're weapons of mass and indiscriminate destruction. Their very existence is a crime. If you're interested, we'll be available afterwards. Uh, for almost 30 years, there's been the alternative New Year's where pretty much the Southern event uh, gathers at the gates of Kings Bay to bring in the New Year's. And it's a fun time. It's a good strategy session. Uh, Kentucky, the Bluegrass Army Depot, where tons of nerve gas, you know, nerve agents, uh, 
uh, have been stored is a little bit of a you know success story because they wanted to incinerate up there, but can cut the Kentucky Environmental Foundation, a local organization, put the pressure on them and they stopped that. But they're still they're still there and they're not dealt with yet. They're just being held there in Kentucky. And it's it's of particular interest, especially with the uh, pressure we've been putting on Syria to destroy its weapons. We just tend to hang on to ours. Now we get into I'm going to speed up just a yeah, little bit. Yeah. Um, and with the lethal advance of the atomic age, it's the most severe and enduring impact on human health and the environment. Uh, this is just a list of uh, you know, nuclear tests from 45 to 92, and how the stockpiles you know, have been reduced, but I mean, how many is enough? So this map represents uh, the National Thermonuclear Assembly Line, and the ones in the south being around Oak Ridge and Savannah River, and out in, out in uh, Texas. Uh, well, we talk a lot about the Manhattan Project and other workshops in Oak Ridge and uh, the fact that local farm communities, some had as few as two weeks to vacate ancestral home to make this big project enriching the uranium for the Hiroshima bomb. Um, Aiken, South Carolina is the home of uh, right next door to Savannah River site, which again is about 310 square miles, uh, took up three counties, uh, they displace uh, whole towns to have a um, facility to produce uh, weapons-grade plutonium and tritium. Uh, tritium being the uh, hydrogen isotope that gives the hydrogen bomb its big oomph. Uh, and it is now you know, being considered for remake. And we've got another slide later to show you a little bit of what's going on there. Amarillo, Texas, the Pantex warhead assembly plant. It's tens of thousands of nuclear warheads you know, have been like, assembled and disassembled there. And it's now part of and uh, you know a program called the Life Extension Program, of which Oak Ridge is part. And, you, and then we have the Tennessee TVA's Watts Bar, which Don could give you much more detail on than we. Um, do you we call them the nuclear reactor and bomb plant? Well, it is. They do produce the tritium for mm -hmm. right, which has a half life of like 11 years. So that's why they've got to keep producing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 is, it, is it still against international law for a commercial plant to produce weapons? That's what we tell the North Koreans, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it really is. Yeah. Uh, this is just uh, nuclear weapons transport routes, and you can see where they travel all over the country. And we have like a, a good crisscross across the South. Um, and this life extension program going on at Oak Ridge, they're 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 retrofitting. I mean, I think we probably have someone in here who knows more about that than we do. We are skimming the surface of what we're finding out, but uh, at the Y12 security complex. Uh, they may be reducing the number of bombs uh, as they, you know, deal with the aging warheads, but they seem to be giving them more firepower, is what I understand. So they take a thousand, they've got to, they're rusting and, you know, they need to check them. Then they re reconstitute them for like, you know, more powerful than they were. So um, this, is a sh this is a period of uh, national and cultural guilt that was building up after um, in the Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And 51, does anyone do duck and cover? Mm. I did, you know, elementary school. And it just seemed like, you know, that's what we were brought up on. They really minimized the threat, didn't they? Minimized the threat of nuclear uh, radiation. Um, and those of us who could afford it maybe built fallout shelters, and those of us who couldn't recognize we were dispensable. And I can't remember what it was, but I had a chemistry set, and it was just advertised as atomic energy. So we were all raised on this stuff, and fortunately, some of the some of the emphasis didn't take. So we get into the big lie. Now I want you to believe, Uncle Sam says, that radiation is safe. I don't believe there's any consensus that there is a low enough that, that there is a low limit of exposure to radiation that does not cause some biological damage. I think that's still correct. So. Um, we had uh, Eisenhower here trying to assuage the guilt of the feeling that people really didn't want to be about building all these horrific weapons. But let's get some propaganda to talk about how our nuclear weapons can be used for the common good. Uh, I think Don said, you know, uh, energy too cheap to meter. They had these little atoms for peace bands going around everywhere. I uh, even issued a stamp. So um, the big lie was not that we needed and wanted to produce electricity with nuclear power, uh, atoms for peace, but they wanted weapons grade plutonium and uh, nuclear is the only energy source that is interchangeable and interdependent. 
uh, between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. When I hear they're talking about one and the same, it is one and the same. Uh, there's, there's way too much evidence to suggest that nuclear power plants, when you add in all the energy it takes them to get there, and just the physics of the plant, they don't produce that much electricity. And then, of course, is the question, they were smelling the money, and so are there these policies for people or for profits? And it is corporate welfare. In 72, Wall Street advised investors to get out of nuclear. Uh, without these massive subsidies that they all get, we're talking about a, a nuclear power industry that is, works at about a, at least a 50% default rate. Uh, and, and it's all over the country. And this map probably could be enhanced with additional ones. But this represents not only power plants, but uh, disposal places and weapons. So this is our you know, nuclear radiation hazard in the United States. Now they stopped dumping this st the little red blocks off the coast. used to be where we dumped. I think they stopped doing that. Is this Homeland Security? And now we have the South Southeast nuclear power plants. They love building all kind of stuff down here because of the um, regulatory regime is a, uh, a uh, regulated monopoly. They're guaranteed whether to produce any electricity at all, getting a certain rate of return. So we have, at last count, 37 reactor units in the Southeast, and that would include Louisiana and Arkansas. And so it really is. It's dirty, dangerous, and expensive. Our friend Mary Olson with the Nuclear Information Resource Service is a really, that's a really good site to go for information, really tons of information on the issue. Of these 104, maybe they're not 104 now, they shut down a few reactors. 104, 99 now. Is mm -hmm. it, and, and you know, 2,000 tons a year of high-level radioactive waste is generated? You have to differentiate between military waste and commercial waste. I mean, military waste is 5 to 10 percent of what's going on in the reactor of these. What did you call them, Don? The, uh, they're not spent fuel. They are highly irradiated used fuel. Yeah. Right. And they're sitting there and the corporations that produced it would love to get it back to us. And if that happens, you're going to see what goes on. Uh, you know, Shell Bluff, Georgia, the Vogel nuclear power plants, uh, you know, before economic crisis hit, there was you know over eight billion dollars that had been like already allocated to, allocated, <laughs> allocated, uh, allocated for the construction of two new plants. And the original two plants down there, I mean, the estimate for four reactors was six hundred million. Um, the cost for the two now is about nine point two billion. Um, the um, and we killed, we stopped the nuclear power construction schedule in the South in the seventies. And now they've been coming back, and the Vogel facilities down there, they're building, you know, the industry sees it as the renaissance. If they get those done, they really feel like it's back. But then we've had, like, you know, Fukushima occur, and the whole powder of nuclear, and, you know, we're at this critical point. Uh, you want to talk about your moon jellyfish that swam up the canals and clogged up the filters? Well, of course. Uh the six southeast Florida counties that are close to St. Lucie and Turkey Point power plants, you know, they're finding a lot of uh, strontium. And particularly in the, uh, in the teeth of like babies. But, but these little jellyfish up here, these moonfish, apparently swam up into the outtake and uh, clogged it up. So they had to like, you know, uh, shut it off and, you know, empty the canals and it wasn't until they had to do that to get rid of the the jellyfish said they discovered leaks. So, so thank you to the jellyfish for, for, for uh, blowing the whistle on that, that problem. Uh, you know, there are like 23 Fukushima-style GE Mark IV nuclear reactors in the United States. Pretty much all of them are sitting near or close or on fault. And, and Don spoke a lot about this in his class. All right. Um, and we are wasting the future. If we're producing so much plutonium and you know, anybody who knows anything about plutonium knows that we do not need 500 pounds each year. And since Fukushima, for the first time in history, we have like uh, allowed plutonium limits in our food, particularly in Japan. So there's no real solution for nuclear waste. Right now, it's an interesting situation. I'll tell you real, real quickly. Uh, when they began to construct uh, nuclear power plants 50, 60 years ago, they knew they did not have a solution for the waste, and, but they made a confident decision. They said in 50 years, surely we will solve the waste problem. So they made the waste confidence decision. So, so you explained that. And so, you know, we got a whole series of meetings are coming up to question this, so uh, no new permits are being let, you know, because of this, this situation. 
in North Carolina and Asheville particularly, we consider ourselves at the nuclear crossroad of, of uh, waste, particularly with the Savannah River site and Oak Ridge, and we're sort of in the middle of all of that. And uh, this idea of the transporting waste, radioactive waste, on our highways, um, folks need to know what they're driving next to and what the risks are in their communities this sort of behavior. And again, why do we reprocess the spent fuel? I mean, it is the weapons grade plutonium, and it's just sort of an insane cycle. And it seems too crazy because we don't want to talk about it, and you don't want to admit that you're crazy, so we just don't talk about it, but we need to talk about it. I mean, is this electricity or bombs? Is this the product of a spent fuel? Uh, the red uh, on the map uh, represents um, where the corporations have been actively planning since around 2008 uh, to build. And you can see again in the south, it's really, you know, you know, inviting. The Savannah River site is the most contaminated in the world by most measures. Uh, it went from the Savannah River site and under uh, George W. Bush's regime, they renamed it to the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership, which didn't sound too good. And now Savannah River is now the U.S. Energy Freedom Center. Uh, I've just put this up here because it's a fairly complex map and it's really nice and green with all these wonderful graphics on it, uh, but the only real green stuff that's happening, like is fossil fuels and some algae and some solar exploration, about 2% of that, the rest of it is relating to like nuclear power or weapons in some, in some fashion. Uh, right next to the Savannah River site in Barnwell is the uh, Barnwell Radioactive Waste Dump. It was you know, for over 30 years and it's closing down recent now, it has been in the past you know, years for the only low-level radioactive waste dump east of the Rockies. We are. Uh, one of the things that killed uh, and stopped the power uh, construction project in the south was this region-wide network of, you know, anti-nuke groups called the Southeastern National Guard. I don't know if anyone remembers that. We were all part of it. We were going over the fences, you know, a number of these places. And with great names like Catfish Alliance and Kudzu Alliance, and now we have, you know, uh, folks were talking about what's going on in, in Middle Tennessee and the, in Michigan burying their uh, decommissioned nuclear reactor. And, and, and there are folks here that know more than I about what's going on in Tennessee with importing, dumping, and burning radioactive waste. And it's really, really frightening. We're the volunteer state. Well, let's not volunteer to take in all of this. It's not required to report public that some of their commercial waste dumps are taking radioactive waste. It's the only state in the union that uh, commercial burning of radioactive waste is licensed. Now round and round and round we go. So what to do with some of this uh, lower level, they call it below regulatory concern, but as we've already established, there is no low level of you know, radiation that doesn't cause some biological damage. We beat this one back one time, but it's coming back, and these are actual artifacts that you know uh, show a signature of some some level of radiation. Uh, There's the, Studsvik again that we encountered up in Irwin, Tennessee. They also have a nuclear waste processing in Memphis. And, and this particularly illustrates some of the environmental racism or the racism in the workplace, assigning people of color to the most hazardous work. But their, their dosimeters are radiation measuring devices, badges, were usually manipulated, manipulated or they were just actually re removed from them. Uh, this symbol was actually created by the uh, International Atomic Energy Association for children. They can't read, but you know, this causes this, you know, it's deadly and you should run. Yeah. The, the slide before, when you're talking about the uh, making consumer products or recycling radioactive waste, what is the status of that? I remember commenting earlier this year, rulemaking, or, or that I guess it's on the, actually it's an EA Fonzie problem. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that um, it is still a possibility, but there was a lot of light shown on it, right. and they may have dialed it down some, but these things just continue to crank yeah, out. It, it's and, been shut down once or twice before. Yeah. Right, yeah, it, it was. It keeps emerging because they have so right. much waste, right. and they really don't know what to do with right. it other than shoot it in weapons all over the world. As we're talking about the energy extraction, and there are workshops here this weekend going to go much more deeply into this. This Hobbit 20 mine site occupation, we went up as legal observers and went up on that site. And somehow, putting your body up next to and walking on a place like that, viscerally, you feel the, the rape of the earth. I mean, 
the the whole idea of going forth with like nuclear power is kind of on hold with regards to a number of things you were you know you know about, but right in this part of Virginia is uh, well, that's the Roanoke River is the country's largest unmined uranium deposits. Uh, dirty energy betrays us all, and this was uh, protesters in Charlotte, a Duke Energy rate hike hearing. Duke Energy, the world's largest publicly traded utility. Um, and the and the, the army, the navy, the air force, marines, they're going to talk a lot of propaganda about going green. And you're going to hear a lot about solar panels they're putting up and they're they're making bullets with less lead content so that they can kill you environmentally. And they, there's all kinds of awareness within the high pentagon about global warming and the impact in, for instance, the uh, coastal regions being lost. They're buying up land all over the we, place. We participated uh, uh, a month or so ago in a genetically engineered tree uh, you know, demonstration, uh, a week of protests against a, a, a worldwide conference that they put in Asheville for all, who knows why. Harvard Gym. Um, where, they're, where they're taking genetically engineered uh, eucalyptus, eucalyptus pines out of Australia. They want to like plant uh, 11 billion of them in the south, which is filled with you know, oils. Uh, there's a lot of controversy over you know, the biomass of just growing the trees, developing pellets, for burning and sending them off to Europe, but the military is pushing it because of the cleaner fuels that can be made from biofuels from these trees. And the military is really not interested and they're very careful because they don't want to promote themselves as environmentally concerned. It's all about combat effectiveness and war fighting capabilities. And I just like that picture. Huh. <laughs> it's called, you know, shutting it down. So what is the cost of war? And we'll speed up here. Uh, the clock behind, you know, technically we're through in five minutes, but we run over five or ten minutes. And if you need to go somewhere, you won't offend us by getting up and going. But what is this cost of war? Well, the first casual is usually truth. Protesting, it's just un-American folks. Loss of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I mean, when we cannot even photograph the coffins returning from war, when the Pentagon is trying to keep us from really feeling and understanding the impact. Um, here's just a little street theater. They were arrested for. Uh, that's, that's, you know, that's Lady Liberty down in Alamance County being arrested for. Um, uh, you probably have heard now that the number of soldier suicides exceeds the number of deaths in the battlefield. Did you have your hand up? Civil liberties restricted. Uh, if, if any of you have been practicing activists, you know that many municipalities try to confine you to so-called free speech zones, uh, or they make uh, onerous uh, permit requirements to try and, and, and kind of discourage your free speech. So I, I maintain that our free speech zone and my permit is the Constitution. And Eisenhower knows every gun that is made, every warship launched, and every rocket fired signifies, in, in the, the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, who are cold and are not clothed. And it goes on and on. He got it. They've got the money for wars, but they can't feed the poor. We were coming into this conference this morning, a foggy morning, and uh, we went over a bridge, probably, I forget what was, we were on Broadway. There was a line of 20 or 30 people sleeping in sleeping bags under a bridge, lined up like corpses. Next to the Salvation um, Army mission. This is in, happening in every city and every place, and they're criminalizing homelessness. These are impacts of our warfighter readiness, of our Pentagon spending, of, our, of what exactly we were warned about. Our entire planet is being devastated. This highway of death after that uh, first Gulf War, um, uh, how, how despicable people retreating and we just uh. the energy consumption is directly related to war to the extent that you know we our our economy is a war economy how is that war economy working for you is an interesting question if you just want to ask someone we have this robust armament industry and if you look at the uh, beehive collectives true cost of uh, true cost of coal posters downstairs if you look at it long enough, and it's so complex and so involved, but in the middle, the focus is the military-industrial complex. The energy is going to support our economy, our industry that's still here, and this armament. 
and the uh, whales being beached up in North Carolina. We're also have to, off of Jacksonville, Florida. It's, a, it, it's one of these rare and remaining spawning areas, I think, for the right whale, if I have that right. But they are uh, exempt from these, these treaties that are supposed to protect these species because they want to make a uh, Navy sonar down there. So it's really sad. Then military violence comes home. This is a, a uncomfortable report from Fort Bragg. We we do train, you know, uh, the most lethal fighting force in the world. We send them out, but we don't decommission and bring them back. And often the spouses of these these warriors are taken the blunt of you know their their illnesses, their the psychology when they come back. There was an epidemic of. Um, you know, spouses being murdered in Fort Bragg over the past few years. Our friend up at the Quaker House, which is a, a group up there that has been working in with, Fayetteville, North Carolina. In Fayetteville, working there on the front lines trying to provide a place where people who have dissident ideas from within the ranks can go. But he started uh, keeping track of how many of the wives on that base were being murdered. And there is an active GI resistance from within. Many of the active soldiers are realizing, you know, the lies that have been portrayed in you know, the way they've been trained, this, this, the lack of services just left to hang and, you know, it's, it's a long fight slogging to convert the military industrial complex, but every now and then you find a couple of gleaming hopes when you talk to the military about it. Courage to resist is a good group on that. I mean, war and the, our spending for war, we're robbing the very people we tend to, uh, to provide defense for. When we have 10 civilian deaths for every soldier death in war since the mid 20th century, 10 civilians for every soldier, what are we about as a people that we, we allow this to go forward? Uh, there is uh, something very, that uh, the Nuremberg principles really did tell us. Now you legal minds out there, we do have international duties transcending national obligations of obedience. That's Maybe next. Maybe getting a necessity defense for doing these things is hard to even get heard in a courtroom. But in truth, we do have this duty to disobey. We cannot say we do not know. We know. So, so what we have next are just examples of you know common folks resisting in different ways. Um, and of course, eternal vigilance. And here's some of, some of the legal observers. We got a crew up in the National Lawyers Guild has a program where you go to actions and you really observe and you become the eyes and ears of, say, the legal team so that if they're called into court, you have some kind of um, notes about what happened. And, and we're both in Asheville and Charlotte and Blair a Mountain. little Occupy thing and outside of a detention center there waiting on some people. We educate, right. agitate, organize, yeah, activate. I don't know. Well, we've got to speak the truth. There's the war crimes times. Hawking it on the street there with the police right in the back. Always in the shadow of the police. Always. If you look in the back of most of these pictures, you're going to see. And these were, this was a group of like 14 year old boys that were uh, homeschooled that decided this would be their project in Asheville. You did the, the home violence <laughs> training. Actually, I did direct action training with these kids. Real proud of them. Well, we've got to create this direct action and what one, one very, very inspiring event was in Charlotte at the DNC last year. Um, this this book of this bus went going across country of undocumented people. The undocu bus. And they said we are undocumented and we're unafraid and they spread their butterfly, their monarch butterfly symbol out on the streets, the DNC and presented we themselves for arrest. And I mean, we've heard about Keystone, you're familiar with that, the Keystone Pipeline blockade. And it's a really interesting legal question that we asked earlier, I've not gotten the answer yet. But how do you feel about a foreign corporation using eminent domain on private property in the United States? And if you stand in the way, there's a foreign security force to come deal with you. That's pretty much what they're up against. And, and here in Asheville, we use a lot of puppetistas. The Veterans for Peace have been standing on the corners there for over 10 years. And even if the movements are stalled, uh, where the mentality is right now is recognizing, you know, why is it not going forward? And we, we're, we're not losing, we actually are learning, because there is not, we realize there is not in place an adequate support structure. How do they get food? What, who are the leaders at the blockade, oh, okay. the lessons learned by the blockade? 
I mean, what support structure do you have? Where is your legal fund? Where are the people that can defend you? And how long will it take? Uh, so we create, you know, also dissident drama. We claim a corner there, and because we persisted there at that corner in Asheville for over 10 years, after many efforts to try to remove us, they, we finally got it declared as a, a, a Public traditional forum. forum for free speech or whatever, um, and got it 24-7, but I maintain every corner we ought to be having declared that way. So We've got to confront these public officials. Um, the Veterans for Peace there, uh, just unfurling their banners. Um, uh, Confronting one of the war criminals up there. That's Condi getting a little bit of bloody hand in the face. He's a local, local boy, like, you know, giving some of the officials hell. So, uh, uh, we were down at my alma mater at Southern Methodist University in Dallas recently because they opened up the Bush Museum. Well, the library. Uh, we we'll called it the L-I-E-B-U-R-Y, the Bush Library. <laughs> and um, we, we, put, we put these bobbleheads on, uh, dressed them up this way, chained them together, and walked them all over Dallas, you know, you know searching for the, an accountability zone. We kept asking them, you know, arrest Bush, arrest Bush. So when they pushed us all out of the, said we couldn't continue with our walk, Bush and Cheney were sent out into the middle of the street, forcing the Dallas police to arrest them on camera. It was really a great day. So we actually got like Bush and Cheney arrested for jaywalking. Yeah, yeah it was a great day to go back to school. Protest, picket and persist. I was in Memphis in 68 and I remember the, 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 the men having to put a placard on that said, I am a man. And I remember the tanks. And I got my first taste of the transforming power of nonviolence in action that um, that year. This is a local UNC Asheville uh, Students for Democratic Society group uh, trying to meet you know uh, young people who are you know who are going to the recruiting center uh, on a uh, you know, truth and recruiting um, initiative. Who uh, does anyone here know what the White Rose Society was? Yeah. Oxygen. Yes, yeah. and these were college students that were like, you know, uh, rounded up for distributing flyers on the campus and within five days they were rounded up, they were interviewed, tried and beheaded. So that the cost of dissent varies depending on the, cli the political climate you're in. And, and we still have a lot of wiggle room before we're beheaded, but it behooves us to act while we still can before we, you know. So there's numbers of ways of blocking the gates, the ways, the roads. This is a one of the one of the dirtiest coal plants up in Carbo, Virginia. This is the Earth First blockading it after a rendezvous. Uh, we have to stand together. In fact, uh, the, on the left, these young folks were part of the Martin Luther King action. Again, back in Asheville on the street corner, and down below here, this is up near Oak Ridge, Tennessee. These folks had blocked uh, the this gates there. But at one point, there were 23 that had stepped across the state. Line. They they face state charges, which were a lot less um, difficult than the uh, charges, charges face now. <clears throat> Sometimes we have to stand alone. We can sit together. Greensboro lunch counter. Um, North Anna climate activists up in the right. Occupy, you know, uh, demonstration. I don't even know where that is. That was uh, on a campus, and and the. Uh, fellow was uh, spraying all these people who were locked well, arms and arms. Is that Riverside? Yeah. Yeah. But not Riverside. Uh, Davis. Berkeley. Or yes. Davis. Yes, you're correct. That was Berkeley. Uh -huh. I think it was Davis. Mm -hmm. Davis. I, uh, you know, we got to lie down together. So we've got to find ways of resisting, and there are many, many, many ways and many experiments in nonviolence in action. Take to the streets. I walk many a time with Brother Atsumi and Sister Denise across the southeast. Uh, they often go to Oak Ridge, they'll go to the School of the Americas, we're at Fort Benning, uh, down here in Selma, Alabama, taking to the streets. We were here up in Blair Mountain, walking to the Blair Mountain. That was a rather difficult march. Take to the roads. Um, this was a gathering down in Augusta, Georgia, where they were considering um, what to do with the waste, uh, radioactive waste. This is the, uh, you know, uh, of the undocu bus. Uh, the yellow bus that shows up, uh, I also do street theater and puppetista work down at the School of the Americas, and this is the crew one year that was down there doing that. 
Now we got to climb the fences. I was there at, in 87 at Cape Canaveral that we were protesting the Trident missile um, launching, and that's Dr. Spock going over the fence. Uh, and this fellow in the middle there is the most recent fellow down in Fort Benning who went over the fence there at that gate. He just was released from six months in prison for a misdemeanor. Do you know what the School of the Americas is, pretty much? Yeah. yeah. We have papers and information on that if you're interested. And Diane Wilson, who's a veteran, she was a Army combat a medic, I believe. Yep. Um, and, and a and shrimp boat pilot. A shrimp boat Captain. pilot. And she was on a hunger strike her 57th day on this issue of Guantanamo and the, the, the egregious injustice going on there. She just takes herself over the White House fence. It was quite a bold action. And uh, she prostrated herself down so when the dogs and the machine guns came at her, they didn't do her in. It took them five minutes to respond. Um, squat, lock, block, there's all kinds of ways to use in our bodies to like, you know, jam up the, the machinery. Th these were some brave young folks there at the Hobbit Mine, and those were some massive machines that were just, what they call the beautiful mountain ecosystem is overburdened, and they push it into the valleys, and they choke all the creeks. Um, I think that sometimes all you're left to do is put your body in the way and take the consequences. Like these three people on the bottom, the, the Transform Now plowshares, um, they've been in the Osceola County Jail in Georgia since their um, uh, conviction, and now they're awaiting sentencing. It may be three, uh, maybe 30 years. Megan, uh, Megan Rice, uh, the center woman, she's 83. I know her for many years. A uh, very determined woman. And you know, they walked on to the Oak Ridge Military Reservation, undetected and undeterred, through the most most supposedly highly, um, what do you call it? Well, they, they cut through four security fences. The last one was a pre-authorized lethal fire zone. They went to like this huge concrete bunker where the weapons grade and ur weapons uranium was stored. Uh, they knocked on the corner with the hammers, you know. Um, broke bread. Broke bread and took a little blood. It was an hour before the guards showed up, and this is like at this most secure facility. You can withdraw your support. We're war tax resistors. I'm not fundamentally against paying taxes. It's just that uh, you know, estimates of as much as 60% go straight to the Pentagon to like fight these wars. I just repeat past to wars, into. current wars, future wars. We do indeed arm the world. And the next chapter that we would like to work on is converting war to peace. And this is like the last slide on, on this series. And so... Uh, there you have it. Uh, that's at least how we see it, and how we found it out. And we know we're only skimming the surface, and it's kind of shocking. And we feel like a lot of this harm is concentrated in the South, and um, it's not the only place it's being harmed, but a lot is here. So thank you all. Thank you all for listening to this. Are you sufficiently depressed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Two comments. Uh, the the nuclear reactors are just as prevalent in Illinois and yes. Michigan, and, and you know, there are all oh, there are lots of them up there. That's one comment. Yes. And the other one is that we are getting national sacrifice zones right now. Wherever we're putting those, we're doing fracking. Yes. Uh, in uh, in the Barnett Shale in all, all Louisiana and Texas, you know, those are all, you know, the air pollution is creating a, a so We don't even know what right chemicals now. are that they use. Yep. It's know, not just from fracking. I'm talking about the production, yeah. the waste, and the air pollution that's generated there. It's just amazing. It's interesting when you, when you mentioned uh, Illinois and the nukes, it's Exelon, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of the largest, you know, nuclear commercial businesses. Uh, and our current president's uh, former um, chief of staff, Ron Emanuel, now mayor of Chicago, and David Axelrod, his campaign manager, were former executives at Exelon. So you wonder why we were pushing hard for news. Yeah. You Anything know, and, and holding all of this in awareness, and even beginning to discover the extent of all of this, it's very difficult. And I can understand we want to kind of hide from it. But the next step is what do we do with the, in the face of all of this? We we are we are um, we are aware and we are responsible 
and we are called to act. So the strategy and the, the tactics, how to do it in a way that we don't, um, well, how to do it effectively. That's a question always before us. Yeah. Can you go back to the Savannah River site slide? Maybe. I'm wondering yeah. if they added wave and tidal power to their branding. To what? That wave, that uh, diagram of the Savannah River site. Yeah, the uh, Energy Freedom Park. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, I bet it can find it. Because <coughs> I know that um, some engineers um, in the Department of Energy. Um, didn't want that. They, um, did or did not? They did. Well, of course. I'll find it here in a second. So we're always, if you have evaluation forms, we're always looking for ways to improve. We are lay people. We're discovering this ourselves. We're trying to find a way to communicate uh, the uh, dire times we're in encourage people into action. So if you have ideas of how we can improve, uh, expand, delete, whatever. And if you have information that we need to correct, we are not experts. But we had fun making this slide. It's pictures. here, I promise you. There it Upper is. left. Yep. Uh, one thing you might want to correct is slide 76. The states where they want to build new nuclear reactors, there are additional ones that aren't on there. I have a map of all the proposals. Oh, do you? Well, there thank are, you. There are 45 proposals at the peak of this new wave. And and I'd love to get information on where to get that map. So. Um, Energyjustice.net slash map. Thank you. I'll write that down. Yeah, that's that's really how we help one another here. So what would, I'm, this is a slide you were concerned about, and what was your question? And they're rebranding. Do they add wave and tidal power to try to be green, look green? I mean, not not in this. I don't think at this particular facility. Okay. But overall, I mean, there is somebody someplace sitting in a government office considering that. And I don't really know about that. If anyone else does, please let us know. But wave and tidal power, generally speaking, the alternatives, even the massive, you know, highly capitalized central production, I mean, you can, you can, you can focus solar energy to a point in boil water rather than, than, you know, cutting atoms, you know, splitting atoms to make the heat. And you actually can use that solar concentration because of the cycling of the fluids all during the day and storing it underground, you know, at, uh, during the day to actually continue to produce electricity from solar at night. So it's being thought through, but I, I can't answer what, which department is actually doing. But it's in the Department of Energy somewhere. Okay. Is there a guy? Yeah. So, oh, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, middle. What's it? I'm sorry. Oh, she well, had you finished. I'm oh, sorry. I was just going to say one more thing. I just know that Georgia, um, that uh, Georgia Tech did do a study in that area for mm -hmm. wave and tidal power. Good. Georgia Tech. Yeah, Georgia Tech. Okay. okay, that's helpful. And tell me the name of that website again. Oh, oh energyjustice.net/map. Map. Thank you so much. Okay, and and get me on the here. Hello, I'm a Middle Tennessee State University student that's located in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, right next to the Middle Point Landfill. Oh, and yeah. I, I noticed you guys had a slide on there that stated there was a whole decommissioned reactor from Michigan. From Michigan dumped into the landfill there. And uh, I think so. This is the, the clearest information I've heard about it, and I was just curious where you guys found that information. Uh, M A T T R, Mothers Against Tennessee, Radi River Radiation. River Radiation, and other groups. We learned a lot more about it down in Chattanooga at a No Nuke Shell Summit. And I had not gone to Murfreesboro to check it out personally, but. Um, What's Gretel's name? Uh, Gretel. Um, Clark? No. no. Don Johnson. Gretel Johnson gave us some information. You know, if we're if we're mistakenly well, I, I think to be more precise, uh, there is 10 million pounds of uh, I think it's Rock Big Rock Point reactor right. from Michigan that was decommissioned, uh, and it was put into the Murfreesboro Middle Point landfill under a program called Bulk Survey for Release, which uh, only allows. Uh, I mean the the. <laughs> The regulations are supposed to allow only very low levels of radiation, but nobody was really checking. But I, I think you, it is safe to assume that the reactor vessel is not in the Middle Point landfill, okay. and that the higher metals that were much higher in radiation 
Uh, if they got into the Middle Point landfill, that would even surprise me. Uh, but what wouldn't surprise me is that the uh, regulations that specify very low levels were probably routinely violated, but with nothing so blatant as extremely radioactive large metal pieces. Um, it was like the, uh, the soil that was contaminated, the, uh, even concrete uh, that wasn't heavily contaminated, uh -huh. but pieces that were actually in the reactor vessel um, I I hope that that one didn't get not. put in there. I don't think it did. Seriously. Well, that, uh, we really are appreciate this fine tuning. Mm -hmm. Are they Barnwell, the, the big point reactor? I, Probably it could be a Barnwell. I mean, uh, I although uh, a lot of the most radioactive stuff um, hopefully was moved to someplace else, like out in Idaho. There's places, but uh, but it, the fact remains that it, it documented 10 million pounds of the so-called lower level. Ten million or a thousand? Ten million. Ten million. Ten in, million. In, in middle point. At middle point. Okay, yeah. thank you. Don't be deceived by the use of the term low level radio. Oh, not at all, no. Mm. I've got uh, the report. I, I can't remember both of the authors, but I know it was Mary Dill. Mary Olson was one of yeah, the... Yeah, Mary Olson. Yeah, yeah, we know She's Mary. She's the near southeast and director. Diane Dorigo, and Diane Rigo. Yeah. And they yeah. did the report out of control on purpose. Right. That's and it's it, great, but it is worth noting. You know, by and large, I agree with you. I mean, in low level, though, just like depleted uranium right. is yeah. sometimes a misnomer. I mean, over yes, the thirty yes. years active at Barnwell, there was like, you know, there was like really serious irradiation issues with workers when they received a low level package and they just right. opened it up and there, you know there were like flashes and people were seriously hurt so yeah I, yeah so low, low level does not mean low risk and and uh, the, the, the US official definition the only high level waste coming out of reactors is the fuel rods right. mm -hmm. basically and everything else is low level right but some of that stuff is very highly contaminated right it's just not the fuel rods so um, you know, the low level then becomes classified as A, B, C, or greater than C, mm -hmm. and the A is the least radioactive, and, and uh, uh, so uh, I think the issue around the middle point landfill uh, boils down to inadequate oversight of that program mm -hmm. because it was a blanket permit that uh, was being really only monitored by the waste processors. The TDAC is ultimately responsible, but they uh, instituted bulk survey for release because they didn't want to have to inspect every shipment. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, nobody knows exactly what went in, but uh, during the decommissioning process, um, I, I, I think, you know, the, the growth sorting of getting the most radioactive stuff would have um, hopefully worked if it was that bad. It, it might have shown up at Studvix down in Memphis for cutting before it was moved. Well, a lot of don't know. go to Studvix, Studvix in Memphis. So like, we, like Donna, we, we talked on the phone before, it'd be really fine. We really would appreciate in, like, in, you know, uh, some focus uh, exchange and fine tuning. And we could even pull out, you know, a Tennessee, you know, section of what we just showed you in like, you know, Sure. And condense it a little bit, and expand, you know, condense and expand. It. So we'd really be interested, in like you know, uh, having people work it over with us. Right. And if there's something you think we've left out, or something that we've stressed too much, or any, we we really open to feedback. New South Network at Gmail. We have um, cards we can hand out to you. We really. We want to improve this. We want to fine tune it. We want to figure out. It's a good presentation, though. You guys. Well, thank you. Thank you. Here's some cards with information.